In 2017, Kim Wilkie gave a widely acclaimed talk in Cambridge on Making a Happy City, which the Federation of Cambridge Residents Associations were very proud to host. So we've great pleasure in welcoming him back tonight. There's a concern that with all the development pressures and austerity and cash-strapped councils, that land management schemes that can will be, as Fergal Sharkey, our previous speaker, has described, more Botox for chalk streams. Scoping the CAM corridor for investment funded by so-called net gain offsetting. As Summer pointed out, spirit of place attracting volunteer support generates the most investor income. Campaigners have highlighted that carbon offsetting and tree planting risks becoming a greenwashing exercise. What could be more spirit of place than a river like the CAM with its punting and ducks and cows on the commons? How do we avoid Botox for chalk streams and scoping the CAM for investment? Rather than thinking about the CAM and its green spaces in terms of a visitor program or an accelerator park program that would generate income, many people are asking how we can protect this wonderful and unique network of traditionally gazed flood meadows and CAM tributaries in a way that will best serve its wildlife, natural systems, carbon sequestration, flood protection, and landscape character. Widely regarded as the UK's leading landscape architect and urban designer, Kim Wilkie's work includes the V&A Gardens, the Natural History Museum's Civic Realm, a landscape strategy for the Thames in London, and the designs for a new city in Oman. Author of Led by the Land and himself a farmer, Kim is a prolific landscape architect who works on large scale projects in the UK and internationally in both public and private spaces. He works on a scale that's beyond the experience of most designers. For example, designing the green spaces around an entire new city in Oman, working with the architects and deciding where the buildings would go. This involved local communities in landscape strategy from the start, recognizing their sense of place and belonging, their concerns about family and health and home, he worked with local communities in an inclusive way to develop the Thames landscape strategy from Hampton to Kew that set out to celebrate and understand the exceptional character of the Thames and create a hundred year strategic vision, of the river corridor that would stand the test of time. How can we do the same thing for a river like the Cam? Who better to ask than Kim Wilkie? Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Wendy. Um... And, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk um, to you this evening. I, I heard Fergal Sharkey's talk and was really impressed, a little depressed too, but um, fantastic quality of, of research and incisiveness. And, and the body of groups that you've got together is already the most important thing you could have done for the CAM. But this evening, I'm not going to pretend to um, give you any direct advice on the CAM. What I will do though, is to, um, to go through um, both the Thames landscape strategy, um, which Wendy described, and, um, and my own local uh, river, um, Chalk Stream, the, the Itchin down here in Hampshire. And um, as, as Wendy said, the Thames landscape strategy looks at the first 18 and a half kilometers of the river as it comes into London from Hampton Court here, right the way past Richmond and up past Kew um, and um, Brentford and into, um, into London that way. Yeah. It's now 25 years into that strategy and remarkably, it's still going strong. Jason Debney is the um, coordinator of it all and brings together the local interest groups, the four local authorities and all of the national agencies. And I've tried to, one, to, to think about the best way of, of pulling out the essentials that I, I think could be useful for the CAM. And I think it's, you start with land and water, basically the geology and the hydrology that has cut through the, um, the, the geology to create the landscape um, that we all live in. The second is settlement and stories. Basically, 
the interaction between that geology and the water and human settlement and, and basically how we think about uh, and, and um, relate to that landscape. And then very critically, how the people and the politics uh, come together. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the last two, this um, seesaw from drought to flood and how critically um, uh, on our chalk streams, we can um, uh, deal with that. And then fifthly, the living environment, probably the most crucial of the lot. So the fascinating thing about the Thames, uh, of this stretch of it is that it flows from south to north. And the reason for that is the great lump of um, Richmond Hill, which di diverted the stream through. And from Richmond Hill, you can see both to Windsor Castle and to St. Paul's and the Tower of London, and from there on to Greenwich. And that interaction between the river, the topography, and those view lines determined its, um, its political and um, uh, in historical development. And what one now has, um, because of the combination of all of those things, is a landscape which has these great open spaces interspersed with urban waterfronts, so that um, all the way through that, there is this great rhythm of open space, um, urban waterfront, people, wildlife, and the river coming through it. And in the center of it, um, on Richmond Hill, is this view, which is possibly um, the most painted view in, in London. And it was um, supposedly the, the, the view that created the English landscape movement. A very simple view of a bend in the river with trees around it and a grazed wet meadow down below, Petersham Meadow. And, um, and what we, we come to then is um, the people and the politics. And this whole study started off sort of remarkably with um, the local people asking me, uh, uh, then 25 years ago, a relatively young landscape architect, to come up with a plan for the river, which put landscape and people uh, at the center of that river. And, uh, at the time, there were the four local authorities were um, not of the same political persuasion, but we managed to submit our, our plans over a, a period of three years and then submit them just before the local elections, which um, really helped them to go through, supported by national agencies on one side and 180 local interest groups on the other. Um, it took an awful lot of understanding what people felt about the river um, and every evening for three years going to different local meetings, but it was helped a lot by the local resident on Richmond Hill who became the patron of the strategy um, and is still very active in supporting it. When I started out um, back in the um, early 1990s, um, it was a period of drought and no one was talking about flooding at all. Um, and it's very interesting now there's so much talk about flooding and we'll be back into drought again. And one of the things that we really began to understand is that the, the river is tidal up as far as, as Ham, Ham Lands and Richmond and then um, the, the tidal lock there um, stops it from the, the, the tide from coming any further up. But at that stage, um, everyone was talking about um, tidal flooding. And in fact, with climate change, it's now been a question very much of fluvial flooding and great storm events. And you can see suddenly the leap in tidal barrier closures um, coming in um, uh, after uh, the year 2000. And those closures were not about stopping the tide coming in. They were about creating a void to enable the river water, the storm water, to fill up um, during the low tide and then be released again. So that whole, uh, as has already been mentioned a lot, that whole management of water and understanding of fresh water um, is, is critical to how we deal with our rivers. And this was that same view of um, 
of the water meadow at Richmond before um, the, uh, the towpath embanked it and reduced and narrowed the river. And what has become very interesting is how those flood meadows still pretty much survive. But um, after the Second World War, a lot of the bomb damage from the South Bank was dumped on top of the meadows, reducing their capacity to absorb the water. Um, and, and then in the 1970s, they stopped grazing many of the rivers. So the floodplains stopped functioning largely. But what is happening now is there's Osterley at the top, um, Petersham Meadow at the bottom, and there's now a cooperation with the Royal Parks so that we can move the uh, grazing um, uh, livestock from the water meadows um, in the winter up to help manage the Royal Park, Richmond Park during, and um, Bushy Park during the winter. And so a real coordination at a landscape scale of how that um, management works. And then moving very rapidly onto chalk streams and um, the itching and how it relates to my hometown of Winchester. And you can see here how the, the network of, um, of the rich in, itching tributaries flow through the city, define it um, and, uh, and relate to the surrounding hilltops. Um, and what is fascinating is to see um, a picture just after the Second World War of the relationship between the edge of the town, the water meadows, the river, and the Iron Age fort of St. Catherine's Hill that defined um, or defines the whole um, character of, of Winchester. On the left here are the water meadows still managed um, by, by cattle at St. Cross, and on the right, um, you can see the cathedral and the lack of management that happened after the 1970s when the cattle were taken off it. One would think great because it's got trees on, but actually that ultimately it, um, is not good for the flooding, not good for the fish and not good for the wildlife. And what has since happened is that many of those trees, um, many exotic trees have been taken out. The cattle have been brought back and um, the whole character of, of Winchester and the flood meadows coming through them has, um, has been restored. And there was a very difficult moment where um, I, I had a meeting with the local community who um, were calling me an axe murderer for proposing to take down all the trees. And, uh, and then we explained with Natural England and the Wildlife Trust, the Hampshire Wildlife Trust, how crucial it was to keep these water meadows open, um, both for flooding and for wildlife. And you can see at the top of the screen here, the restored um, meadows just at Winnell to the north of the city. And then the, um, the quality of the um, water um, where we now have salmon spawning within the water meadows where the trees have been removed and the cattle have been brought back in. Um, we face just as many problems as you do on the cam, but there are some good news ways of, of bringing back that traditional management of the meadows. And I attended just re uh, recently a, a fascinating talk um, by the um, Pasture for Life and Plant Life um, Forum on um, floodplains. And the, um, uh, and then David Gowing of the Open University put up these amazing slides which show how deep rooted um, uh, herb rich uh, water meadows um, go, their, their roots go right down um, native plants, right down into the soil, and with their exudates um, sequester carbon deeply into the soil. And what's really interesting is his chart here which shows how species rich floodplain meadow sequester carbon into the soil um, more actively than broadleaf woodland and certainly um, uh, more than twice as actively uh, as um, uh, arable and horticulture. So this is an example of um, a flood meadow at Cricklade and then Petersham Meadows down below. So it's, it's, it's very interesting how often 
um, traditional management of floodplains gets bad press because of the ideas of methane, but it's actually completely missing the point about getting carbon back into the soil. And a healthy soil absorbs water, cleans water, and takes it down into the aquifer where it really should be stored um, uh, to keep uh, everything healthy. And just um, uh, to finish off um, relatively quickly, um, this is the pattern of the um, early floodplain channels and management at, in, in Winchester. Um, but we don't have to just ape what happened um, before. We can take things forward and use new design to achieve those ends. It doesn't have to be always backward looking. And so a little bit further down the river, um, uh, I've, I've created this network of channels um, in what had been leveled for a polo pitch between two arms off the etchin. And, and so those channels are very much of our own time, but they really work um, with the, the wildlife and the management of the meadow. So here you can see, this is the meadow, there's the cathedral in the center of, of Winchester and the network of, um, of, of meadows that come all the way along the, the river. Um, and, and with it came the Southern Damselfly, which had almost gone extinct, but um, moved in before we'd even finished the um, digging the channels and is really thriving there along with the, the salmon and, and the otters. And this is a view of, of those meadows in frost and in mist, um, just to show that it isn't always retrospective. We can bring new design in to achieve whatever we want along the rivers. And um, very conscious that using the right cattle um, and red poles are very much uh, of the CAM um, are where um, the CAM should go forward. Um, but there's a lot of concern about um, people, cows, meadows, and, um, and there are lots of ways of um, dealing with that. Um, and, and I'll probably um, talk about that more during the question and answer. But I would just say that Cambridge for me is the backs, the water meadows, and from Hingston right the way through, there are these extraordinary collection of um, flood meadows that serve everything from cultural landscape, water management, wildlife, and just make Cambridgeshire the most amazing county and Cambridge the most fantastic and iconic city. And so if one can work with these landscapes and with the people who want to use them, they are practical, they are not expensive to maintain, they create food, they're brilliant for soil and carbon and um, for wildlife, insects, and the future of the world. Thank you very much.